This podcast is intended for investment professionals only. So hello, and welcome to this latest edition of Elgin Talks. Today, I'm delighted to welcome back Lisa Purdy, our Head of DB Solutions Distribution, and I'd also like to welcome Ian Blake, a Senior Solutions Strategy Manager. My name's Anthony Penson, and I'm a Content Manager here at Elgin. It's great to have both of you with us, Lisa and Ian. Thanks, great to be here. Today, we find that many DB schemes are in a position to be considering their endgame options. But before we dive into the detail of what we actually mean by the term endgame and the options available to schemes, I wonder, Lisa, if you could kick things off by giving our listeners some background on the journey that DB schemes have been on in recent years, including what has led them to this point. Yes, thanks, Anthony. So we've seen a vast shift in UK DB schemes over the past 20 years. In 2006, when the Purple Book started, there were nearly 8,000 schemes and only 12% were closed to new benefit accrual. Today, that number is 5,000 schemes and 52% closed to future accrual. So you can see over the past 20 years, there's been a dramatic shift in the market away from DB schemes to DC schemes. Now, this means that these DB schemes have become much more of a financial legacy a risk on the company's balance sheet, as opposed to a HR benefit for the current employees. Now, back in 2006, the aggregate funding level was 97% on the PPF's funding basis. So this means that pension schemes didn't quite have sufficient assets to meet all benefit payments. We then went into the global financial crisis and years of low interest rates, and pension scheme funding levels worsened, many sponsors had to pay in significant sums in order to fund the scheme liabilities. However, over the last couple of years, that's turned around and we've had significant rises in interest rates and strong asset returns. So these funding positions have improved significantly, with the aggregate funding level now estimated to be 134% on the PPF basis. So we've moved into this position where these DB schemes can start thinking about what their endgame might be. Thanks, Lisa. And on that note now, Ian, turning to you, if I may, we do hear a lot about the word endgame in DB pensions. So please could you give our listeners an overview of what we actually mean when we use the term? By definition, the end of a scheme is when there are no members left in the scheme. In other words, they've all retired, been paid their pensions for life, and there are no more surviving members or dependents. This will take many decades for most pension schemes. The question then becomes, who is responsible for the scheme over its lifetime? Which could be the sponsor and trustees if they decide to run on the scheme in in perpetuity, supported by administrators, advisors, etc. Alternatively, the scheme could complete a buyout with an insurance company and then responsibility for the pension scheme is transferred from the sponsor and trustees to an insurance company. Until recently, many schemes haven't been well enough funded to consider these questions. However, now most schemes are in a strong funding position, there is a large focus on what the end game might be and what this means for the scheme's investment strategy. Thanks, Ian. And Lisa, you recently wrote an article on our blog called You Choose the End Game, We'll Build the Bridge. And in that article, you discuss three key potential end game options that DB schemes are typically considering. What are they? Yeah, so Ian mentioned two main end game options being buyout, which is where a scheme looks to transfer the responsibility for paying members pensions to an insurer. Secondly, run on, where a scheme looks to continue its focus on paying members until the final member benefit is paid. However, there is this third option that I mentioned in that article, and that's where it could be a bit of both i.e. running on the scheme for a number of years and then moving to buy out. Now, there are a number of practical reasons why this third option may be appropriate, such as needing to manage a liquid asset portfolios, administration factors such as data cleaning exercises, and also capacity in the insurance market. The government is also looking at whether trustees and sponsors might be able to extract some of the surplus in these DB schemes. Now, that could be used to enhance member benefits, could be paid into the DC scheme or paid back to the sponsor. Or indeed, actually, a combination of the three of those factors might be quite likely. 
So when we talk about building a bridge to your scheme's end game, what we're really referring to is how we can support schemes from where they are today to their end game of choice, be that buyout, run on or both. Thank you, Lisa. Perhaps could you also talk us through the rationale behind why schemes might be considering each of those options and the types of investment thinking that schemes may wish to consider for each one? Yes, of course. And I'm going to actually start with some statistics. So in the LNG large DB scheme survey, it showed that 77% of schemes are targeting buyout. With the remaining 23% not planning to buy out, i.e. looking to run off the scheme in perpetuity. Now, most of that 77% are currently targeting buyout in the next five years. OK, so answering your question, buyout has traditionally been the most popular endgame, as it's seen as the gold standard from the perspective of member benefit security. And that's because insurers are required to hold a very large amount of capital. And that's not only to have sufficient assets to pay for all the expected benefits of the members, but also to cover very large risk events. So specifically to cover at least a one in 200 event. Now, this is a really strong regulatory regime, which can give trustees confidence that the responsibility of paying member benefits is going to a good home. Now, if we flip that around and say, why wouldn't a scheme buy out? You can really distill that into three key reasons. So firstly, affordability. Second, the practicalities. And thirdly, looking to grow a surplus. Now, I know Ian's been doing a lot of work in this area, so I'm going to pass on to him to cover these three points in more detail. Absolutely. So I'd say the affordability point has largely fallen away given the significant improvement in scheme funding positions. Liquid assets can play a part, but that should just stall rather than prevent a buyout. There's also some schemes who may be seen as too big to transfer as an insurer, but we're increasingly seeing larger and larger deals being written and all schemes will eventually become smaller in time. However, for schemes where buyout is affordable or close to being affordable, and where there's no insurmountable practical hurdles, there may still be a case for looking to run on. A key point here is that under a buyout, 100% of member benefits will be met in full, but there's no potential for any further upside beyond the surplus at the point of buyout. A number of people are looking at this and questioning, is there a better way? For example, can the surplus of the scheme be further grown in a risk managed manner? I'd say typically the answer to this is yes. By running a portfolio largely consisting of bonds, for example, investment grade credit, you can target further growth of the funding level of the scheme by say one to 2% per annum for the next 10 to 20 years until the scheme really starts to shrink. Clearly, the potential for generating further upside to both the members and sponsor is a particularly attractive proposition. There is an ongoing consultation from the Department of Work and Pensions in this area, so future legislative changes to make ongoing extraction of surplus easier would likely lead to more schemes taking this approach. Thanks, Ian. And could you give us a quick overview of what the investment strategy looks like for different end games? And perhaps if you start with buyout? Yes, uh, absolutely. Regarding buyout, we currently see a number of schemes who can afford to buy out, but it may take a few years to being able actually to transact due to more administrative aspects, for example, cleansing scheme data. For those schemes in what I'd frame as the buyout waiting room, it's vitally important to ensure that the scheme assets are moving as consistently as possible with buyout pricing. We believe the best way to achieve this is to invest like an insurer given the key determinant of buyout pricing is the cost of an asset portfolio to match future liabilities. This means fully hedging interest rate and inflation risks and running a high allocation to investment grade credit, given this is the main asset class which insurers hold. Potentially around a 50% allocation to investment grade credit. We're increasingly setting credit sensitivity targets for our clients in addition to interest rate and inflation hedging objectives. And what about run on? For those schemes looking to run on, I'd not expect the investment strategy to look hugely different given the key focus will still be on running a risk managed strategy. There would be an even larger emphasis on matching liability cash flows 
given the scheme is running in perpetuity. This can still lend itself to having a large allocation to credit, given this asset class can achieve all three goals of hedging interest rate risk, matching benefits, and generating a yield that is above a typical liability discount rate. The key area where the portfolio could differ is due to the longer investment time horizon. This definitely opens the door for including more illiquid asset classes such as property and infrastructure debt, and potentially a prudent allocation to growth assets. Thanks, Ian. So just lastly, how do schemes invest for a balance of both end games? By definition, this will be somewhere in the middle. Given you want the ability to switch to a buyout if circumstances change, this likely limits the amount of long-term illiquid assets, but the scope to hold some shorter-term illiquid assets. One aspect we're increasingly seeing is clients looking to hold exactly the same type of credit, which is attractive to insurers, to increase the likelihood that the insurer would accept these assets in specie as part of a premium payment. This is known as matching adjustment eligible credit, and we're increasingly implementing these types of strategies for our clients. So in summary, at a very high level, I'd expect investment grade credits to be the cornerstone of scheme portfolios, regardless of their end game. I think I take from Ian's answer there that credit can be a really important asset class for clients focused on that end game, whatever that end game is, buy out, run on or both. Now, Anthony, we're going to turn the tables on you and ask you a question. So can you please let our listeners know what content on Endgame is coming down the line? Absolutely. Thanks, Lisa. So the main piece of written content we have in the pipeline is the first in a series of three Endgame white papers. This one will focus on run-on, including how schemes can invest in that light. The paper will also include research on how a scheme's investment strategy might be influenced by a decision to target a potential surplus and the planned timing of the extraction of that surplus and how that influences investment strategy. On the blog, we'll continue to have regular charting updates following the market moves that matter for DB schemes, as well as a continued stream of articles focusing on specific aspects of endgame strategy. On that note, I'd like to thank you, Lisa, and Ian, both for your time today, and also a big thank you to our listeners for tuning in. As a reminder, this podcast is intended for investment professionals only and shouldn't be shared with a non-professional audience. This podcast should not be taken as an invitation to deal in legal and general investments. Any views expressed during this recording belong to the individuals and are based on market conditions at the time of the recording and do not reflect the views of legal and general investment management. Forward-looking statements are, by their nature, subject to significant risks and uncertainties and are based on internal forecasts and assumptions and should not be relied upon. Where individual stocks are mentioned, these do not constitute a recommendation to buy or sell any security and are for illustrative purposes only. Legal and General Investment Management Limited is authorised and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. For full terms and conditions, please visit our website. To find more content, you can check us out on Twitter, LinkedIn and our website. Copyright 2023. Legal and General Investment Management Limited. All rights reserved. No part of this publication may be reproduced or transmitted in any form or by any means, including photocopying and recording without the written permission of the publishers. This material is issued by Legal and General Investment Management Asia Limited, the Licensed Corporation BBB 488, regulated by the Hong Kong Securities and Futures Commission, for professional investors only.